The mountains of central Utah have a rugged beauty. The people who settled the valleys they protect were attracted by that beauty, but also by the prospect of earning a living from the land. Many were brought to the area by the Mormon church or by the railroads. They came to be farmers and ranchers, but they also came to be miners to work in the coal mines that are hidden below the cliffs, and to dig the coal that warmed their homes, powered the train engines, and provided electricity to the West. These are proud people who understand very well the hard work and courage it takes to be a miner, as well as the camaraderie that defines the miners' lives underground. I had a good life. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed working. I miss the man more than I do anything. Friendship that you never lose. And I loved coal mining. Even though I loved it, and I loved the men, and the best people in the world you ever meet in that mines. This, this is something about coal mines. It's, it's just the feeling that you have. That's where I needed to be. It wasn't easy work, but it, it was good work. You know, it supported your family. It's just something we do. This is what we love. This is what we do. My dad was a coal miner. My grandfather was a coal miner. So I come from a family of, of coal miners. Carbon County was based on, on coal mining. Carbon County is very unique to, to the rest of Utah. And it was the place where all the uh, different ethnicities came for the railroad, or for the mining. People of every denomination and uh, every background. It was, it was a wonderful experience to grow up in a mining community. The town and the people were like their own little family. Everybody was friends, and everybody did whatever they could to help each other. It's a beautiful place, a good place to raise a family. The community is very close. When you grow up in the mining community, you know from a very early age what can happen. The Wilberg mine and the Deer Creek mine were starting to, to be put in as large facilities uh, uh, to mine the coal for the plants that had been constructed in Hunter and Huntington. Wilberg was an excellent mine. It had good conditions, uh, good people. The Wilberg was probably as good a mine as there was in the West. I think it was one of the safest mines uh, around. Everybody tried to do their part and tried to keep things safe. I, I never felt at risk in, in any day that I worked in the mine. I felt Wilberg was a, was a safe mine. I wouldn't have been there if I didn't feel safe. It was a good mine, it was a good producing mine. Wilberg was unique, uh, very unique. You had a lot of vertical relief in a quick hurry. And horizontal real estate was at a premium. The access to the coal seam sat above the valley floor um, nearly eight or 900 feet. Once you got to the coal seam, you didn't have any room for facilities. The office and bathhouse and warehouse and an early shop actually was created in the coal seam. There were two long walls in the world, were 13th right and 5th right. The continuous miner develops long tunnels and a long wall is set up and essentially traverses back and forth and removes that entire block of coal the long wall mining process is much more productive. The roof collapses behind the shield that supports the top. You're actually retreating and removing all of the coal. If it just keeps caving until it finally levels itself out and it's cave solid, a gob. Nobody ever goes back into it. The shear is essentially uh, due to the design of the cutting drums. It moves the coals onto the pan line and then uh, the pan line tra uh, transports the coal down along the face and dumps the coal onto what's called a stage loader. And then it's uh, dumped directly onto the, the mine belt that takes the coal out of the clear to the surface. When you develop a long wall panel, you only have two entries. You have one with your belt and one with your intake. Your intake returns out the beltway. So your belt line there turns into a return as well as a neutral. Wilbur, the layout into the fifth right section that was different than most uh, mining sections that I've been involved in. You traveled into the mine 
and then you went under an overcast, and then you actually was traveling back out of the mine to get to the mouth of the fifth right section. The entries are between eight, nine foot high and 20 foot wide. So the mains had five. So you had five entries and then the fifth right went off. It had three and then it went down to two. You connect entries one to the other one, it's got to cut across to connect each one so that you're not too far away ahead of your air. Usually they're on 100, 100 to 125 foot pillars just a solid block of coal that is left there for support. We have to put stoppings in ever so often. We have to put a man door in that's away from get from the intake or the neutral air into the intake or the return. I was a long wall maintenance superintendent basically for, I think, 10 years. About nine people would be a good crew. Probably two mechanics. You'd have two shear operators. You'd have a head gateman that ran the controls at the head gate. You'd probably have three prop men and one person on the tailgate, which was the gas watch. If you have a cribbing crew that's got a crib, as you come out and they got to build cribs in the entries to hold the entries open, uh, generally they had four or five people. In the fifth right section, the retreat on that had not been very far, maybe less than a, less than seven or 800 feet. I was the uh, long wall coordinator over at uh, Wilburg. We, uh, we'd had a good year. We'd had a darn good year that year. Depending on your wall conditions and what have you, you can produce up to, you know, 20, 30,000 ton a day or more. You know, miners have a lot of pride to have a world record. Yeah, you use it on top. That was going to be the first uh, Wilburg. Everybody was concentrating on uh, mining and getting a record, which there's nothing wrong with that. I've, I've done that several times in my career. Anybody that's a good coal miner does that. Miners are very proud people. Uh, they're no different. They're like a lot of people. They're very competitive. They're very spirited. That was a very common thing among mines to boast that you were the highest producing long wall mine in the country. They had to bring extra people because we were mining faster than they, than they could keep up with. The crib line had to be adjacent to the face, but we had to keep people to keep that crib line up in front of the face. Some of the people off 13th right would have provided extra support. The other long wall, of course, down 13th right <clears throat> was down. And so I would run back and forth, make sure everything was going well. And I could see that the other one was just going like, like mad. The continuous miners were doing well. The, Longo was doing extremely well. On this particular day, there were 28 people on the section. And so as I went to go by the uh, mine manager's office that night, uh, the room was full of, of a lot of the senior people. Uh, I said, hey, what's going on? Vic said, we're really having a great run. And he said, we want to go cheer on the crew. And uh, we're going we're gonna to give them give more congratulations as well. Uh, it was an unusual circumstance and quite unordinary. Well, I was a shift foreman on days. Uh, Dick Cox was a shift foreman on afternoons. And uh, so he was, Dick was on shift at the time of the fire. I got a call from 13th right that that long wall was about to start. And they asked me to go down there and tell them not to go too heavy so they wouldn't have so much coal on the belt. That's when the power went off. It was around, oh, 6.30, 7 o'clock. Dick Cox, who was the uh, afternoon shift foreman, comes in and and he comes he to comes the pan line. And of course, we have raised the pan line. We're working underneath it. And, and I says, it won't be long now. I, I want to say we lost power at that time. And he says, I've got to go see what the heck's going on. I had the uh, head gateman call me and says, hey, you know, you've got to come to the phone, it's important. So that's the first time I find out that, that we've got, uh, you know, an incident in the mine. We've got to evacuate the peoples. And then I went back to fifth right, went up on the intake. As soon as I got there and could see the smoke, I knew something that was wrong. And I make the corner and come down to the end of the section. There's just a heck of a lot of smoke. And, and I'm looking at the overcast, and, and Dick Cox is standing just, just out by, and, uh, that's all he can say is uh, fire's out of control. We, uh, the 
the men are in the section. That's the first time that I know that the men are still in the section. Uh, he says, and power's off, we have no water. When you have a mine emergency situation uh, and there's a possibility of explosive gases, you need to, to cut off the electrical power into those areas. And you try to maintain ventilation, especially in the escape ways. Provision should have been made to keep electrical power to the pumps, especially for firefighting. When I got a call from the mine, said we got a fire on the long wall. We got people behind it, and we haven't heard from them since the fire. I said, well, I'm on my way. Uh, I told my wife, I said, we're in trouble because of, I know the long wall tailgate's closed. We had a long a roof fall, and there was a route out through the bleeders, but it was not the ideal situation that we would have liked. In the conditions that were mined in Utah, having a block tailgate or having uh, a bleeder that may have had a KE or a floor heave wasn't all that uncommon. You could find ways and to deal with that. In six right, as the roof had, had crushed, you know, from the the long wall, it had been the head gate right for the previous long wall, and so the weight had really crushed the cribs, the roof had, you know, had, had spalled and and the roof or the floor had heaved. Between fifth right and sixth right, there was a what they called a squeeze area. Anyone coming up to that would would just decide that it wasn't passable. Earlier that evening, Kenny Valdez and I think Gilbert Madrid and one other individual, they went together, the three of them. They couldn't get through. So they 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 found a tag and they dated and tagged and initialed where they were at and what time they were there. Kenny Blake was the only one that uh, that we could account for that was out and had been involved in, in the fire, didn't really know where he'd been. I was standing about 10 shields down the face from the head gate, and the pound line shut off. So I walked up to the corner to ask the cornerman, why did you shut the pound line off? because I didn't know something had broke or what, and I needed to go down the face or what, so. He said, well, somebody called in here and mentioned smoke. And I looked around, and it looked a little bit smoky, and I said, it looked like just exhaust off the muckers, hauling cribs up. You got exhaust, diesel exhaust, and stuff coming off those muckers. And, well, at that time, the guy, this coordinator that I'm talking about, dropped the phone and hollered to the head gate and said, get the people off the tailgate, and out the belt line, he said, there's a fire in the intake. I was going to go down and grab as many rescuers as I could find and carry them up to the corner so those people didn't have to come clear off the face, go down the intake, and then back up and around. We had a cache at the tailgate of the long wall, and we had a cache at the kitchen, and then we had caches on both man trips. They had maps. They marked the maps, tell us where the caches were. When I got down there, I couldn't see. I mean, I run into smoke and I couldn't see. I got almost to the power center. I could hear the power center humming, but I couldn't really see it. So I was kind of feeling my way down. And two guys come walking up the entry and they had two rescuers each. And they didn't have their rescuers on and I didn't have one either. And so the one guy says, here, I got these rescuers. And he handed them to me and I said, well, let's put them on now. So we knelt down and all three of us put a rescuer on. I said, okay, let's head out the belt line. And they said, well, we don't know where to go. So I'm assuming they were part of the cribbing crew. And they said, well, you follow me and I'll get you to the belt line. And then you go straight down the belt line. So when I head straight down this, just keep your hand on the belt rails or whatever and follow this belt line down. And I went first. And then I never did see him again. I, I kept mine on a four inch water line with pipe. It was tight to the belt structure. Well, when I got to the belt line, there was a there, you know, a bunch of people were sitting on a lip. Jim Bartuzzi, I believe it was. And he told me, he says, we can't get out the belt line because it's hot on the other side of the door. And I opened the door and just stuck my hand through and you could feel the heat coming through there. So he knew there was a fire there. I told him that was, you got an hour's worth of oxygen. We've already used 20, 30 minutes of it. You know, we better do something. And there was an older gentleman there and he says, well, follow me. And he ducked underneath the belt line. So I followed him and we were in a cross cut that they had basically cut. And what it was, it was a regulator for the belt air. And 
I lost him in there. I didn't know where anybody was. And so I was just basically wandering around in there by myself. And I kept walking into timbers and hitting them with my cheek. I scraped all the skin off my cheek and I kept walking right into them because I couldn't see them. But while I was looking for them, stopping. And I'd find a stopping and I'd paw that whole stopping trying to see if there was a man door in it. And I found a door in the stopping at the very end. I walked probably 100 feet and I could hear the fire. I could hear, I couldn't see it, but I could hear it. You could just hear it roaring. Well, I can't go this way. So I turned around and went back against the air. And I kind of looked like clouds coming instead of solid smoke. And I kept walking and finally I passed the point where I could see the smoke coming around a corner. And then I knew where I was. I was at the return of the long wall, where the, re the long wall air was dumping into the main return. And there was a door in that one. I went out that door, I looked down the entry and I saw this guy dragging a hose. And so I helped him drag this hose down to where they were going. And I asked him if, if anyone else had come out of the long wall and he said, I haven't seen anybody. And I said, do they know outside what's going on here? And I had a call about, I don't know, it must've been six, seven o'clock that night told me they had a fire. I got on the phone and called Kevin, and, went, and then I went and picked him up, and we went to the mine. Things just start racing through your mind. How big's the fire? Is anybody in there? Are they trapped? Uh, what's going on? When he first got there, we went up to the elevator, and things were black, kind of chaos. Uh, nobody knew what really was going on. I could see some smoke, and I could smell some smoke because I got close to the mine. It was a totally different smoke coming out of there, and it was a scary smoke. It was bad. I knew it was bad. Ray had called out all the mine rescue team members. He informed us that we actually had miners that were in by that were. The, the miners that were actually unaccounted for, and that uh, we needed to get in there and, and see what we could do to contain the fire and get to the people. The night of December 19th at about 10 o'clock p.m., I received a phone call from a man named Ray Guyman, and probably for the rest of my life, I'll remember what he said. Huh? He said that, uh, he says there's been a fire at the Wilburg coal mine. He says there's people trapped, and he says you need to get here as fast as you can. John called. There's a problem over at Wilburg. He says, but this time a lot of people are involved. I remember getting to the mine and it was, it was pretty chaotic. You always believe that somebody's alive until you know differently. There's thoughts going through your mind about all the things you know could possibly happen. And so during all of that time, uh, we, went, we worked with the belief that we were gonna rescue these people. Dave Blariski. And he called me that night and said, he said, we've got a major problem. We've got a fire. We've got 28 people missing. And he says, can you come over? I was in not long after midnight that night. You know, it was a, it was a struggle to find a, a razor, right? I didn't even think about it. And I went up to the mine and had a beard, so I had to scrounge for, you know, these old discarded razors. and. You know, take the scissors, get the beard off, get on apparatus, go underground, and uh, and start fighting fire. A lot of the coal miners were still coming out of the mine, and uh, the ones that didn't want to stay in and help, and they wasn't wanting people to go in until they knew who was in and who was out. It was pretty chaotic when we got there, and uh, we were probably there an hour before we actually got direction as to what we were going to be doing. The night of the fire, we lost the senior mine management at the mine, as well as the senior mine production man in the main office. There was not a lot of people that knew much about mine fires. So now you have to figure out who is going to have that charge and who has to make those decisions. And we did try to set up what we called a command center, where decisions were made as to who would go underground. The teams were trained to get themselves ready, to, but it was, it was difficult just making sure you had transportation for the teams. So you had several mine rescue teams that come from uh, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, 
Nevada, I, I, New Mexico. I know a New Mexico team was there, but yeah, there was over 30 teams. We established the command center in an office right across from Imshaw, Imshaw's office. They had taken the mine manager's office. The other big coordination effort that needed to go on at the time was was material coordination for underground to, to get supplies to these people. The support people, I just can't say enough about how, how important they are. Purchasing people, they were all over trying to get materials. I mean, if you don't have materials coming, you're sunk in the water. So you had all this communication coming into you and you were trying to build plans around what you were learning. And, and that included making sure that you had enough resources, enough mine rescue people, that you had enough oxygen tanks, that you had all the things you needed to have. And, and so all of those things were going on. A fresh air base is established at the point where conditions no longer permit barefaced exploration. In other words, where the atmosphere is bad. Uh, anytime a team goes in by the fresh air base, we always have a backup team so that there is help immediately available. Because our fresh air base was actually in by the, the fire. So to get to the fresh air base, you went actually in past where the fire was, uh, turned and then came back to it uh, three or four entries over. Uh, it worried me a lot that we had people in by that fire fighting the fire. And the reason they were working so hard is to keep the fire from breaching into the intake that was out by us. Well, they had men out by that were installing temporary curtains on the intake. And once all of the temporary curtains out of Bradish cloth were installed, then they started to erect steel stoppings. That provided us a fairly safe alternate escape way because we were in by the fire. And my team was responsible to kind of stay at that fresh air base and attack that fire where you could so it didn't burn through and cut off that access. We had a constant communication with the fresh air base by mine telephone. We put a redundant system in so that we had, in case we lost communication on one phone, we had another phone that we could reach the fresh air base. We made sure that we had a mine map or mine maps at the fresh air base. And then as we would send teams into the mine, they would make notes on those maps of any conditions or things that they found, especially any, any bodies or people they might encounter. We did some things that, thinking about it, shouldn't have been done. But given the same situation, I would have done it again. You know, because my, my focus was on rescuing my friends, my brothers that work. You know, so, yeah, I, I took a calculated risk. Two people. <clears throat> Uh, came to me and, and wanted to explore the sixth right from their fresh air base. And they wanted to do it by themselves uh, with apparatus. And one of them had a beard. And uh, I told him he couldn't do it as long as he had the beard. Uh, but for some reason, I, I uh, relented. Kenny Valdez and Daniel Brink took it upon themselves to take two mine rescue apparatus and explore sixth right. They explored into Crosscut 13, if I remember right, where they had a cave in the tailgate. At that time, they turned and retreated back out towards the fresh air base. When they got to Crosscut number eight, Brink went down. He ran out of oxygen. So I remember putting the apparatus and crawling my way over and to the uh, corner of the long wall when the gentleman I was with hollers that uh, we have smoke at our back. He's, you know, he uh, says we're trapped. And he'd put an apparatus on, he had a rather large beard and he'd taken in some bad, bad air. And uh, so I says, okay. I says, we're getting out of here. We get within, oh, 
the last 500 foot, and he finally goes down. Holy crap, he collapses. We really shouldn't have been there to begin with. And they'd already been in fighting the fire for quite a while with no apparatus on at all. They had all sucked a lot of CO in, and see, uh, carbon monoxide doesn't get out of your system very fast. Kenny had to try to pick him up and get him going. He couldn't get him going. He turned and literally ran back to the fresh air base as fast as he could. He grabbed the three guys that were there, mine rescue apparatus. They went back in the tailgate, back to crosscut number eight, which is 800 feet. And Gilbert Madrid was the individual that took his apparatus off and give it to Brink. So they were sharing three apparatus amongst four men to get them back out of that tailgate entry. Dan Brinks was, was on the ground unconscious, and he was wearing a, a Dreger unit, a self, you know, a BG 174, and his face mask was off. And I could see he had a full beard on. So I figured he, we were in CO, and uh, and there was a Gilbert McDrid was there. He was just trying to revive him. He had decided that he was going to buddy breathe with this individual that had gone down. And we took off on a run and drug him back out to the fresh air base. And when we got to the stop in and went through to open the door, there was another team there of, uh, I think they was from Kaiser. There was about six or seven of them and they came through and they went up and got Dan Brinks and brought him out. They was all in, in bad shape with carbon monoxide. We loaded the guys up and, and actually did CPR on on the one guy all the way out. And so as soon as we came out, they uh, took them and, and took them to the hospital. They all survived. It was amazing that the two individuals made it back out of there the way they did, especially Brink. We truly thought we were gonna lose him. And uh, that was a tough deal for me because that was my decision to let that happen. And uh, uh, it was countered everything that I knew. There was a lot of people that was, that was trying to fight the fire. Those people only had the regular self-rescuers on. I was under apparatus when I went in the first time. There were, there were several people there fighting the fire with no breathing apparatus at all. I was telling some of them, you guys need to get out of here. The air's not good. If it caves, you're in trouble. And they pretty much said, no, we're gonna stay here. We're gonna, we're gonna get our brothers there in there. We're gonna save them. Usually it's when we're under apparatus, we have uh, almost four hours of oxygen. The weight of the apparatus on the BG-174s are about 50 pounds. And uh, they, over time, they do get heavy. There was times I wouldn't even take my apparatus off. They'd just change the bottle and the canister and I'd go right back in. Once we got into the fifth right return, there was, initially we, we run into light smoke but as we got closer to the mouth of the fifth right section, the smoke got denser and denser and denser, and there was a cave in the intake, and, and people were actually at the edge of this cave fighting the fire. You could actually see flames. We were making uh, good headway. The fire, we were putting the fire out, but more guys were showing up all the time from uh, different mines, different team members. I was in the belt line fighting the fire and it looked we were gaining putting the fire out and all of a sudden the water the hose went limp lost all water pressure and I stood in front of a stopping uh, a cinder block stopping and it got red and then just burned out and things got worse and worse and worse after losing the water we took a giant step backwards because what happened is everything we had pretty much cooled down, had kind of rekindled. The pipelines that were going, out, some of them up the return, were made of fiberglass. And so when they restarted the, the pumps, um, the water wasn't getting into where we needed it to get uh, because those fiberglass pipes had had melted enough that they wouldn't hold water anymore. So there was a lot of crews that was also out in the, the intake, actually putting in a new six inch aluminum line up the intake to, to get water back into where we needed it. And of course, when you lose 
a water line, then you, you, lo you lose valuable time and the fan is running the whole time. So it's, so the fire is being provided with ventilation and oxygen and, and uh, at a very high volume. We were fighting the fire in the return. Just intense, intense heat. Couldn't get close enough to the fire. The water was dripping off the roof in that entry and it was super heated. I remember the water dripping down the back of my neck. The heat was so bad that it almost felt like the rubber on your mask was just gonna run off your face. Using water directly on a fire has positive and negative consequences. Uh, it does cool the fire and it does help to put it out, but in a fire that hot, it breaks, it breaks the water down to its, to its chemical composition, which is H2O. The problem is that H is hydrogen which also makes the flammability and the explosibility of that fire area go sky high. The hydrogen would form and it would form near the roof and it would ignite because we had enough people on teams that would say duck and the flame would shoot right over your head. We had the fire out and we were going and I felt heat on my neck. I turned around and we had flames behind us. So we had flames in front of us and behind us and we were in the middle. And a fireball went across and the whole in front of us started on fire again. So then we had to start all over and make our way forward again. We were near one of the overcasts that had burned out. And it was unbelievable, the, the, the heat and the cold blowing out over the top. So Ray and I went back down there and I was just a little horrified because we had, we could see fire, little flames of fire lapping up around the overcast. So what that told me was we had a thousand foot of return on fire. We had a hole through the overcast and we had hoses going through there. It was so intense that you had to wrap your hands with wet rags so that the steam didn't burn your hands. We were rebuilding stoppings and uh, bumping rock dust, bone generators, water, and everything we could could get to, to get at the fire. When, if there was any little pinhole or anything in a stopping, it would glow red around that because the gas is coming right there to get the oxygen. And so we were having to go in and, and put new stoppings in front of the old ones. And we set foam generators up in the number six entry, about crosscut 38. We were creating a foam plug, and that foam plug was pushing towards fifth right and above fifth. It was pushing the smoke away and the flames away. We hadn't trained with foam. It was kind of a new thing. A couple hundred feet down, downwind of where our foam machine got set up, there actually got a uh, rock duster set up also because as the foam would come by the rock dusting machine, the, the rock dust just knocks the foam down. The rock dusting machine should have been shut off. We never did get it controlled. We was in a fuel rich fire. At one time we was burning probably three tons of coal in a minute. You know, there's no way you can control that type of fire with the uh, water hose. Every fire is different. Uh, just like every person is different. It has its own personality. And I came out of the mine one time and I was covered with, uh, I think it's called creosol. It's a byproduct of the coal and everything that's burning. And uh, it turns your skin black and, and burns it. This one lady news person asked me uh, what the fire was like. So I asked her, have you ever been to hell? The majority of that time was under apparatus. You weren't thinking about uh how tired you were at? We were essentially there most all of that time. And of course, you can only work so long and you have to come out for rest. We had a, uh, some cots and that set up in the, the warehouse that was just down the road from the mine. I was tired like everybody else, but uh, we were running on adrenaline, I think, you know what I mean? Uh, people didn't want to quit. You know, we lived on adrenaline for quite a few days. I dropped one apparatus off and they had Benjamin working there. All I remember was trusting them with my life. My job, of course, was to get every apparatus ready to go. I tore them apart to clean them and then began to test the equipment, make sure it, uh, it passed every test that was required for it to be ready to go again.
there were teams exploring as the fire was being fought by other mine rescue teams. The problem w was with the fire that the, the smoke and everything was so bad that you, you, you couldn't see a lot. Normally, you would go with your own team, but if you have a team that's not familiar with the workings of the mine, then we would, we would send uh, someone who was. Your safety is the first thing in their mind. I, I knew that my safety was still number one. It, it came before their mind. And that, that's a very comforting thought. We had a lot of mine rescue teams in there, and they stayed and fought that fire. I think it was some of the greatest heroism of people to risk their lives to try to save other men's lives. I didn't have a map of the mouth of that section. The dog lay opening was there. We, we, we actually advanced past that and fought a fire past that for several hours. The smoke in the return got lighter and one of the teams noticed the dog leg and it was like wait a minute this here's the dog leg we can get in here we got asked to go over into the return and see how far down the return we could make it we got down to a doorway that was right across from the dog leg coming out of the section so we was we was close to um, actually really close to where a lot of the, the first ones that we found dead were, were found. My team was the first team to advance into the fifth right section and we found the first nine bodies in the dog leg. I was, I was 34 years old. I'd never seen that, dead, that many dead people at one time in my life. It was something that you knew that was gonna happen. Seeing what we were in, knowing what they were in, you, you knew they weren't coming out of their life. They sent me in there to, to find out who they was. And as I, I walked in there, I, I knew them all. A memory that'll stick with me for the rest of my life. Some of the earlier teams had found about nine bodies in that dog leg. And as we would come and go back in there looking for other bodies and other people, we would have to continue to step over those bodies. I was on the team that actually made it across the long wall face. And there was, there was several bodies laying there. And those guys, I don't think they had a chance at all. Uh, they didn't have time to put the rescuers on or, or anything like that. It, it, the smoke, the CO hit them real fast. I remember vividly that uh, as we got into the sec, making our way into the section and it had cleared, the smoke had cleared a little bit, they saw a white reflector, which looked like somebody with their cap lamp indicating come. Unfortunately, uh, as we got closer, we realized that what it was. Uh, we continued up into the section and uh, started finding bodies. We found all of them but two. Uh, of, of the two that we didn't find, uh, anywhere in the section was Jim Bertuzzi and Gordon Conover, and Gordon Conover was my nephew. We had started the process of, of starting to recover some of the bodies back to the fresh air base we'd established in the area back there. The fire at that time had continued to work its way out of the mine. And it got to a point to where uh, it, it was just too dangerous to have people in the mine. We were in by the fire the whole time. And we all knew that if the fire burnt through the stoppings between the belt entry and the intake, we were trapped. On December 22nd, that happened. I had gone through a man door into the return to look at that area. That in itself short-circuited the air enough that uh, I felt like somebody had put their hand on the back of my neck. And it was like a branding iron with a torch. It was so hot. And it caused me to quickly jumped back into the neutral air. And just as I did, it, I won't say exploded, it ignited. And I was come really close to being burned. Um, at that point, uh, you could see the smoke that was in the entries pulsating. It would go 
20, 30 feet down, and then it would, you'd hear kind of a bellow and it'd come back again, and you'd see these surges. The, the mine was probably getting ready to blow. On uh, Main West, the stopping, well, it turned red, and then we watched it, it just went out, and that short circuited the air and caused their recorders at the fan to show that enough gases and stuff back there that there could be an explosion, and that's when they evacuated us off the hill. I lost contact with the, with the mine rescue team. And uh, that team was uh, being led at the time by Kevin Tuttle and Curtis Steele. We had one of the men monitoring the fan that uh, come racing into the control room down the hallway and racing and saying, it's going to blow. It's going to blow. We had M. Sean side. They were analyzing. We had a guy that was analyzing, you know, the explosive nature of the, the gases uh, in the return air. And so they said, you know, there's potential for explosion. We need to get out of here. So they, I mean, we were under a K order. When they said leave, we had to leave. We got those guys and, and got outside, got everybody out of the mine. And the chaos that had happened at the first of the mine was nothing compared to the chaos that was going on. There were a lot of people that didn't want to leave at that time, but you have to make the call to get them out. And eventually they would have been trapped had they stayed. Just, you know, we, we knew where the victims were. And uh, you don't want to send people into harm's way to recover victims. And uh, I made that decision. So we left. I uh, went outside, that's the first time I'd been outside, and it was bright, sunshiny. There was 18 inches of snow, and it was black as black. It reminded me of the last days of Pompeii, where the ash was falling out of the air and the whole canyon was black. Chaos was the word of the, of the, of the, of the day on the day that the, that the mine had to be uh, evacuated. Some some people acted calm and some people acted frantic and some people were completely out of control. Well, you saw all kinds of sights. There was also a concrete chute that we used for trash that we dumped off of that. There was a two inch rubber hose that was attached to that. People were grabbing that and repelling off the garbage chute. They weren't fully clothed or they had blankets wrapped around them. They had told us at the warehouse that they were afraid the mine was going to blow. And so that they were bringing everyone down from the mine. But they made everybody stay outside so that we could check and make sure that everybody was off the mountain. And so those poor people were out there. And I mean, all this weather, it was horribly cold. I think I was the last one to leave. Uh, we headed off the hill and walked down towards the parking lot. I told Art Bruno, who was the uh, manager of maintenance for Energy West, and I says, we need to get that fan shut down, <clears throat> or we're not going to gain a whole lot. And Art says, I'll, he says, if we can get in the substation, I'll kill the power. Morgan and I actually boosted him over an eight-foot chain link fence. He ran to try and shut all the breakers off in the sub, cut all power to the mine. I'll never forget the haunting sound of the diesel backup for the fan kicking on. This diesel backup had been a problem. It never came on when you wanted it to, but that day it came on and, and the fan started back up, belching the black smoke. Emshaw would not allow anybody back on the property or at least for the time being because of the possibility of an explosion. They come up with the plan to shoot out the radiator and one of the uh, uh, local guys, he had his uh, deer rifle in the back of his truck. And so they ended up taking him in the helicopter. He shot out the radiator. The, the fan overheated and seized up and, and stopped running. Once you'd done that, then the fire went back to being fuel rich. You didn't have the flames and you wasn't having all the real damage. That probably saved the mine. Well, it was sad. It was discouraging because you couldn't find anybody. They tried as hard as they could to rescue people. Everybody was just devastated. You know what I mean? Almost heartbroken. We, you know, we were defeated. You know, 
worked so hard for so many days, and there's time that it still troubles me to this day, you know. And that's been, what, 31 years almost. I remember waking up that next morning with the heart, being heart sick, because I look up to the mine to know now you're going to steal the mine with people in it. And I know all these people, you know, and they were great, great guys. You never forget. You put it aside, but you never forget. December has never been the same. It's, it haunted me. I guess it still does in some ways. I was worried about getting home for Christmas. Uh, then I realized that there were men in that, in that mine that wanted to be home with their families, too. I'd lost everybody, uh, primarily everybody that was senior to me. I'd lost a long wall crew that I'd supervised. No other Christmas has been like that. It was such a dark time. It was the Christmas season, 27 families without a, a family member. It should have been a joyous time, but it wasn't. When there is a, a mining disaster, the families, they, they band together. It concerns everybody, and everybody pulls together. You found out who lost their lives pretty much when it was all done, when they could do mo no more. It impacts the community um, immensely. Uh, whether you know the family or personally or whether you don't, they're minors. From Price to Orangeville to Emory, Castledale, every community was on edge. Everyone was praying. Everybody was wanting these miners to make a home for the holiday. It was someone's father, someone's son, someone's husband, someone's daughter. Yes, yes. It was a rough time, and it was a rough time for a long time after, you know? So you take a mine that at that time, I think I had about five or 600 employees, and nobody's working. The whole area was devastated. You gotta remember you have a wife and family sitting at home that's worried every second you're gone. Our, our families knew that we was on my rescue team that we would be probably called to some of those things. They, they, they worried for us, but they knew we had to go. It's very frightening. You are very concerned because your husband is going into a place that is hell on earth, basically, when it's on fire. However, you're also very proud that they have the courage to do so. And if it was my family trapped in that mine, I would be thanking almighty God for the men that have the courage and the dignity to do that. The fire started on the 19th. People didn't really know for sure that everybody was dead until the 22nd or the 23rd, I believe. And so what a terrible way to go into Christmas. And when it becomes obvious that they're not surviving and that all hope is lost. It is, it's a time where you, you pull from reserves that you don't know you have. You, you join together, you, you comfort, support those who have lost someone. So after we evacuated the mine, the, uh, the efforts then turned uh, to being able to take the oxygen completely away from the fire. And in order for us to do that, we had to seal the mine. When we put a mine sealing plan together, I knew that if you walked away from this, we'd probably lose the mine forever. In fact, I think it was around February 7th, we got approval to breach the seals to go back in. That was a pretty intense day because you just weren't sure what you were gonna go into. The heat from the fire had caused a lot of damage, uh, caves, uh, unstable conditions, ribs. There were places that we weren't able to access at all because of the damage. We just weren't able to access the original entries, so we had to make other entries to get around the fire area. It took about a year from the time the mine was sealed until we were able to break in and finish recover the bodies out of the mine. What was it like to go back in there? Well, it was like going back into what you might think hell would be like. Uh, of course, everything was completely smoked up, almost to the point that, that smoke and, and dust and soot had covered all the surfaces to where it would just absorb all the, all the light from your mine light. It, 
A lot of times when the fire went through, it didn't do a lot of damage except that uh, it made the top coal pop off the roof. Sometimes it would be hot enough that it would actually try and catch on fire again. The mayor was always concerned that the fire would come back after the ventilation was restored. Through that year-long process, through that recovery, we learned what hard work was. I have never even since worked that hard. So it wasn't just about production, it was about we need to get to this location so we can recover those bodies. There were six teams of us. We were under apparatus quite a bit of that time. We'd advance and build temporary stoppings with Bradish and Lattice, filter the air in, and we couldn't drive the vehicles in into that way. It was all hand packing until, until we got the air established into that section. Uh, the company had support teams, and a lot of people would come in and do all the the re roof bolting and the cleanup and the re-support and the re-ventilation, building new stoppings. What's pretty uh, amazing about that whole thing is there wasn't a single person that got seriously injured, no lost time accidents. And there were some pretty nasty, there were some very nasty things that, you know, that they went through. It was hard all through that time. During the memorial, when they dedicate that Wilbur Memorial, my friend's Bert's son was there. He was probably about six, seven years old, I think. And he just, you know, he pointed to the mountain and said, my dad ain't here. He's stuck in that damn mountain. It wasn't just going back and starting to wind up and moving on like if you just had a fire. There was a, a driving force there to, to get back in there because we had, we had people still left in there we had to get. We were just not whole until I was taken care of. There were guys that they found in that dog race, the first bunch they found, they told me that they was all had their mine rescues there, but they didn't have them in their mouth. I just presumed maybe, you know, they, they figured they were safe there. It took almost a year to find the last two. And uh, we didn't have any idea where they were. Um, you know, we, they could have been under a cave somewhere. We may have missed them on the way in. And my team got to the tailgate, and within uh, about a 15-minute period, my team found uh, the one individual, uh, and uh, Team 4 found the other individual in the bleeder. Jim Bertuzzi and uh, Gordon Conover were at uh, two very distant, or separated locations. Jim Bertuzzi tried to make his way out the tailgate, and the conditions were bad because the roof had, had crushed, you know, from the, the long wall. It was just really impassable. When we found uh, Gordon Conover, he made it through that area, which none of us could make it through it. So how he made it through it, I don't know. The will to live, and he had done everything right, and he had taken his self-rescuer off, put another one over around his neck, so he dropped it on the ground. He'd never put it in his mouth. I'm sure he thought he was in clear air. Because I was involved in the, in the training of a lot of these individuals, um, you had hoped that they had used that training. I used to tell them that once you decided that the time was to put one on, there was only a couple times that it would come off. You were unconscious and it fell out of your mouth, or you were changing from one to another for a refresh, or you were outside and you're looking at clear blue sky. It, it's pretty sad seeing something like that, that he, he, he had made it, he'd made it through it. If he would have kept walking, he, he knew his way out. My guess is he got in the air that looked clear, thought he would save it and use it when he got in some bad air again. Not remembering that carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless, tasteless gas. So he felt, he, he fell unconscious and to his death with a life-saving device at his side. It cost him. And it appeared that he had just sat down to rest. And like Kenny Blake said, if you sit down, 
that's where they'll find you. We were told that actually it was a, a compressor station that, uh, that uh, where the fire originated and that, that was the main cause of the fire. Right at the mouth of the section from the main line, the belt line, there was a compressor that was in by a couple cross cuts and that's where the fire started and because the air went in by and past the compressor and then it turned and went up into the fifth right section, carrying the smoke right into the section into the crew of men. Yeah, somebody turned the compressor on accidentally and it run for two or three days. That shouldn't have happened. I mean, we were able to determine the length that that compressor ran unattended, unchecked. Well, people didn't know it was running. There's a bradish in front of it, no stopping. And you were driving by it. Well, you hear sounds in coal mines all the time. I mean, so now you have all these events and all these stars lining up, and the air hit the, the uh, oil hits the uh, the air, and it spews onto the roof. It spews onto the coal walls, and you have ventilation now. It's the perfect scenario for uh, a very catastrophic fire. Today, I think mining is safer because of those events that, that you learn from. It's, it's a sad situation, but if you learn from it and can prevent one from happening in the future, then, then the, the job got done. Make sure you have a, uh, a good up-to-date map and know the escape ways out of there right off the bat. If the guys that were, that died in the fire, knew their escape ways, knew how to, knew where their self-rescuers were, they would have made it out. My biggest thing is always be aware of your surroundings, everything that's going on around you. Keep your eye on the roof, keep your eye on the ribs, know what, who's there with you, who's not there with you, and pay attention and remember your training. After the Wilbur disaster, uh, Federal law now requires that there be a lifeline run from the working sections to the surface. There are different shapes on it that show you where self-rescue storage stations are, where refuge chambers are that you can get to if you need to, and the cones point a certain direction so that they can show you the way out of the mine, so. CO travels in advance of smoke. Put your SCSR on at the first indication of a fire. Do not wait for smoke. You don't wait for your boss, you don't wait for anybody else to tell you to put your rescuer on. If you feel threatened, you put your rescuer on. But there were people who were wearing their rescuers, but not their goggles. You know, if you don't wear your goggles, you get carbon monoxide in those ducts in your eyes. Carbon monoxide poisoning is accumulative. It's not, it's not something that comes and goes, it builds up in your system. The carbon monoxide gloms onto the hemoglobin and uses it all up. You have no oxygen carrying capacity. You're done. When someone goes down, there's really nothing you can do for them. For whatever reason that they went down and their life expired, another life expiring because you tried to help that one really doesn't solve anything. Now, that's easy for me to say. That's very difficult to, to probably deal with. I would have a very difficult time leaving someone behind. So there was massive new uh, efforts to improve training, not only here, but all over the industry. Now all of a sudden, everybody had to put their hands on their rescuers. When you're in a situation like that, if you're in smoke, if you're disoriented, if you're scared, it's got to be automatic. The new training now is you do it in dark. The overcasts uh, that separated the, uh, the belt, the return and the intake air were made of aluminum. They failed very quickly. We got rid of all the aluminum lines, for example. We did away with aluminum overcasts. And we were also using some collapsible tubing to ventilate transformer stations and things of that nature. And that's not allowed anymore because it melted. Almost instantly it melted and that permit that flexible tubing anymore to be used. There is a lot of people with a lot of experience that will retire, be retiring. It's gonna have a big impact. Pay attention to your old timers. I was one of those kids that were 10 foot tall and bulletproof, but when it comes to mining and when it comes to seeing and knowing the dangers, uh, there's a vast reservoir of knowledge there that you need to tap into as, as quickly as you can. And, and, and get that out of them before they retire so that 
that you will be a safer miner. When you're in the mine, you need to protect yourself. You need to be on alert everywhere you go. You have to slow down and take five minutes and you need to think about the job you're doing. You know, soak in all the training, pay attention, make sure you know what you're doing, and hope that you never have to use it. The first thing I'd say to mine rescue teams is take it serious. Take that training serious, learn, learn all the aspects of it because you never know when you're gonna be asked to respond. But still, your safety is in your hands, so keep yourself safe. It, it's fun to work in a coal mine, if, you know, if you don't get hurt and the way to not get hurt is you know what you're doing. You need to eat, think, and sleep safety when you're in the underground mine. I mean, expect the unexpected. If you think about what can possibly go wrong and plan for it, then you can prevent it. A very wise man, and he's a friend of mine, he's passed, he says, Gilbert, learn to listen and listen to learn. And if you can do that, you will not have a problem in life. Yeah, listen to your trainers. Listen to the experienced people. And don't take any chances. Ask somebody. Because if you don't, you might get hurt. Injuries in the mine are serious. Sometimes they take your life. Just be the best you can all the time. And follow the rules all the time, not when it's convenient for you. Because I think that's when... That's when people, their minds go astray and, and things happen. Do your best to pick a good company that uh, expects people to be safe and work safely. Safety is good for the business, you know. It's not a good thing when people get hurt and people get killed. We never learned anything from production and uh, great accomplishments. We learn from the hard things in life and, uh, and we get better from that. Going home to your family at night's the, the most important part about coal mining. This is every day you enter that portal. You know you're going in, but you never know if you're coming out. If you're trained, it's not gonna hurt you. It's gonna help you. And if I have anything to say to these young people, pay attention. Do things right. Watch yourself. Watch your fellow employee. If you see somebody doing something wrong, don't be afraid to say, hey, that's my life you're, you're jeopardizing. Let's do it the right way. You do gotta learn to take care of yourself and, and be safety conscious. You wanna be able to go home and, and hold or not come home at all. And you don't wanna hurt somebody else. That's what a miner's life's about, you know? You mind you mine together, you work together, and if something happens, you fight like hell together.